Hello and welcome to the Omnex webinar, IATF 16949, New Editions You Should Know. Today's presenter is Chad Keimel. During this webinar, if you have any questions, please enter them into the questions dialog box. We will be starting the web webinar in approximately three minutes. Thank you for the patience. Hello and welcome to the Omnex webinar IATF 16949, New Editions You Should Know. Today's presenter is Chad Keimel, Omnex CTO and founder. Omnex is an international consulting and training organization headquartered in Ann Arbor, Michigan in the United States. Over the ch course of Chad's successful career, he has served on the Malcolm Baldridge Board of Examiners and has received numerous quality achievement awards including the Quality Professional of the Year Award from the ASQ Automotive Division. Chad is also the president of Omnex Systems, a software provider for ISO 9001, 14001, 27001, and many more. Chad is the author of seven books and more than 100 papers, including several on integrated management systems. During this webinar, if you have any questions, please enter them in your questions dialog box, and Chad will answer them at the end of the webinar. This webinar is being recorded, and a link will be sent out to anyone who would like it at the webinar. Take it away, Chad. Miles, thank you very much. Welcome, folks. I am actually talking to you. From a, from a city called Wuhan in China today. And uh, also for that purpose, I had uh, these slides uh, translated into Chinese. All right, let's uh, go right to the agenda and spend the next hour talking about what's going on with IATF 16949. As I go by here, um, I did not really intend for my staff to translate 
the all, all the marketing. You know, one of the things I like to tell people, though, just for you to know, is how global we really are. And um, so one of our customers, we offer training in 26 different languages all over the world. All right, let's go right to it. So this is the agenda for today. You know, I've had uh, emails and requests. You know, what's going on with the IATF, you know, audit? What's the, you know, how are things changing with the majors and minors? And I promised I would do another update. So we'll continue doing this. You know, um, all of you are interested in knowing what's going on. So we'll spend probably maybe 15, 20 some minutes talking about the status of the IATF 16949 and the majors and minors. And the remainder will spend on FAQs, SIs, and highlighting those key things you should know about. And we'll finish up with the AIG VDA FMEA and sort of the conclusions of this one hour presentation. Folks, this is the data we have. It's, um, you know, by the time you get it, you know, it's a, it's a couple of months old. You know, it's, we have the data up to January that's been shared. When you look at this data, um, you, you have the data for tier ones. You have the data for global. Global means everybody else. Tier ones, of course, the ones, the, you know, supplying the OEMs. It's very critical. They get certified because, you know, you, you don't want to start the um, purchasing on hold and, and desourcing process because they don't have a certificate. So there's a big discrepancy between the audits conducted and the company certified. You know, the latest um, email to you, we, we mentioned, so if these there's enough manpower to actually audit everyone and finish, let's say, maybe latest October or no November, if you look at the current rate. But of course, the big gap is the companies are not getting certified and they're failing their audits. And because of that, if you look at tier ones, um, you know, it's going to take much longer than that, maybe first quarter of 2019 for tier ones and much later for global. All right, so interesting information. Uh, one more thing I'll just share with you. If you look at the difference, so the difference here is 36 minus 17 is 19, the percentage that failed. The percentage 19 is more than half. So more than half, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's lagging by months only because People are not ready for the um, certification audit. It really, really confuses me why. Well, let's talk a little bit more. All right. Uh, just to tell you how we came up with this, you know, we, um, we looked at, um, you know, we did some data analysis. Uh, I go back to my, uh, you know, my professor, Dr. Alan Spivey. I, I don't quite know if he's, if he's still alive. In regression, and you know, he's a, one of those famous statisticians, and he always said, You got to look at the data. So, this is what the data looks like. So, we did um, not only just math, but you can eyeball things, and you got to eyeball things. This is tier one, and then this is global. So, maybe some of these curves can be adjusted. Of course, if we want to get things done sooner, we're going to have to add capacity. And I am sure this is happening currently so that, you know, things don't quite take. I just can't see at this current rate that will be done by September. Okay. All right. Let's move on and let's look at the, this is the data. So I've given you three sets of data in terms of, the top 10 minors and majors. This is from August, the last time I shared with you, I think it was in November with the August data. And if you look at the, the um, January data, only one change. 
So we see problem solving making it to the top of the list. Otherwise, the miners from the, uh, aug uh, the August data pretty much held up. Let's look at major nonconformances. Look at the major nonconformances. This was the top 10 list, you know, as of August 2017, but 30% of three of them have shifted. So when you look at this, you, you see that 10.2.1 um, uh, and, um, you know, nonconformity and corrective action. Number two, internal audit competency. Those are pretty steady. Maybe the order changed just a little bit, but completely new to this list is the control plan. I'll just remind you, the control plan is, there's two big changes in the control plan. One is you need to have the linkages between DFMEA, PFMEA, and control plans. And the second one is that the PFMEA and the control plans, or the FMEAs and the control plans, need to change based on a number of events. Those are the big changes in control plans. Folks, I did spend one webinar talking quite a bit in, in regards to you know, what we have to do to fix it. So, and these are pretty steady. Um, my suggestion is to go back to one of those webinars because if, if I, all I do is spend a whole hour explaining these clauses, um, it's something you can do more in a, in a training class regarding this. A couple of comments I wanted to make is back in August, we introduced a top 56 list from Omnex. And at that time, I, I mentioned to you, please focus on this top 56. By the way, if you had looked at this top 56, the shifting would not have these new ones coming in would not have bothered you because all the NCs that we're talking about are in this top 56. And if you only have time to focus on the vital few, I would say look at the top, look at this top 56. I'm quite sure more than 50% of your nonconformances, if not more, will get, you know, will get resolved if you if you pay attention to these 56 um, top majors and minors. And this is what I would focus on in an internal audit that you are going to do. All right. So if you did want to get your teams a half a day or a day in terms of, you know, getting prepared, these are the top 56 you could ask somebody like Omnex to do to help you make sure you're ready for the registration audit. All right. So <clears throat> some, some uh, additional statistics. The number of NCs on average per audit is about 5.3. Audits have multiple majors as well. The data coming out of AIAG, IATF, you know, it's, it's a little confusing. It's, it showed a ratio of eight to one. Uh, something is wrong with that data. I'll have to go back and, and, and find out a little bit more, you know, what that ratio ma means because it was eight to one. A uh, majority of the 5.3 are majors. We do know, you know, there are lots of majors. If I'm not mistaken, it's about two is what I mentioned to you last time, two majors per audit. Let me just tell you, in our experience, because, you know, we do get around, um, registrar auditors are being quite kind. Some of our large customers who have hundreds of plants have told me they think this year is actually, um, you know, auditors are being easy that the real tough audits will come next year. So this is this is what we're seeing. We are seeing lots of people not prepared going for the certification audit. We are sometimes called in, often called in now, 
right before the audit, we're asked to do the internal audit, and the internal audit is a is a is a blowout. And and we wish we had three months. You know, we do help them, and some of them we help in a month and a half get certified. But honestly, some of these companies, even though they're getting certified, probably should not. But even with three months of preparation, companies can actually do a pretty good job. Okay. So this is what we're saying here. A few preventive measures completed correctly can greatly help companies with their IATF audits. All right, let's move on. And I'll just, just mention to you here, I, I'm, I'm uh, visiting Omnexus uh, China offices. We have uh, offices in Shanghai, Suzhou, Wuhan, and, and uh, Guangzhou. And I'm also using this opportunity to swing by our offices in Thailand and India before I'm, I'm done. So that's what's happening here. I hope the, the Chinese here doesn't throw you off. So, all right. That sort of concludes the, the first part of what I wanted to share with you in terms of the IATF, the current status. Folks, let me pause here to see if there are any questions or comments you want to make, I, I do believe I will have time to ask questions. And I see some questions already. All right. Somebody is asking me about the uh, something we had mentioned on the control plan. It, it is going to come out in the FAQs, and if I'm not mistaken, also in the sanction interpretations. So just hold off for a second. Folks, um, you know, when I look at the nonconformances, you know, many of these nonconformances are happening because of lack of understanding in terms of the oddity. And the FAQs are written in the hopes that clarifications can be given to the auditees in terms of what's really going on um, and, and how to, you know, to bridge that difference between the um, registrar auditors who are giving nonconformances and the auditees' understanding. So FAQs are seen as clarifications. I'll just say this, though they're seen as clarifications, which means nothing has changed uh, for the auditee because they just had a different understanding, it, 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 they see it as a change, okay? But sanctioned interpretations actually change the requirements of the standard. Just want you to understand the difference between FAQs and sanctioned interpretations. All right, let's continue. So, we're not covering 1 through 11. I covered that in the last webinar. I'm going to cover just the new ones as 12 through 20 that's been added in. This one is a little trivial because this very same um, FAQ was there in ISO 9001-2008. The idea being that you can document multiple processes in one documented process. Right, nothing wrong with that. You can um, you can group them into one documented process, and and each of them does not have to be a standalone. There is no nonconformance for that. Okay, but we knew that already. So not as interesting. So the FAQ 13 is very interesting. This is one of the three top um, FAQ slash SIs. I'd like you to take away, but of course, not all of you have product safety, uh, products with product safety. You know, I've spent a lot of time talking to you about many customers that we, we are helping sometimes don't even know that they have a product that's, you know, part of the, you know, product safety. Okay. I mean, but this is today, this FAQ is not about that. We already covered that. In, in it was part of the FAQs 1 through 12. In this one, it's about levels of training. If you look at 4412, you do see the levels of training requirement in there. 
So number one, what the what the IAT, IATF said is, hey, people assigned to specific tasks need to be competent. And one of these competencies is understanding rules and regulations. So regulatory requirements. All right. That's that's the first point they're saying is part of the competency requirement. Just it's, you know, it's what we expect because it's part of, you know, there's regulatory requirements you have to you have to know. And number two, if you look at it now, A, B, C, D, E, F, you know, it's following the A, B, C, D, F in comments to 4412. So what they're saying, number one, is you we need to be aware of our statutory and regulatory requirements associated with the with the markets for use of the parts as identified by the customer. The supplier needs to know where to research the regulations. That's number one. Okay. Number two, a bunch of things now on in B, C, you know, and D and E is about customer specifics. So B, C, D, and E, you need to know, you know, this product that you're supplying for what customer, and it's very specific to that customer. What kinds of things? Customer notification, special approvals for the design FMEA, identification of characteristics and the controls. Things like that are very specific to your customer and you need to know that. And then it says item F through M can also be analyzed similarly and determine the level of training, you know, what kind of training, meaning at what level of the company and what kind of training and a source of training. And one of the things they are mentioning is that and it's very true. There is no standard training available because what you have is very specific to your organization and your customer. So that's something like that will have to be custom developed for you. And, um, you know, as we leave the slide and what they're just, just telling us is some customers may have specific requirements regarding product safety, training, knowledge, and personnel. So some of you listening in, I've had lots of dialogue in terms of product safety, and you have done some uh, quite a bit of work in terms of um, regulatory requirements and the research for it. And for some of you, we're working with you and helping you identify it. All right, let's move on. FAQ 14, this is a very simple one. It just says, you know, if you have a lab, that's either doing a calibration or testing, that lab certificate needs to have the logo. And, and the logo is from, a, you know, may not butcher the organization's name, ILAC. I'll mention that again because it's mentioned in the sanction interpretation. So the logo and the accreditation symbol actually tells you, you know, if this, um, the certificate that you're you're holding is really a valid one. If it's not valid, they really haven't, you know, been audited by a proper body, you know, sanctioned by the IATF. It's not sanctioned by the IATF, required by the IATF, but sanctioned by ILAC. All right, let's move on. This is a second takeaway I'd like you to take away, you know, in terms of the, uh, from this webinar, is the idea of the embedded software and what is the responsibility of an internal auditor or a supplier auditor? So there, what they're saying is the, in the automotive industry, the idea of the intent of IATF is to have the same level of rigor in software as we do for, you know, mechanical parts or hardware. Okay. So, and, and what they're saying is, just like parts, software has defined performance, operating conditions, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Of course, you knew that, right? But what they're saying is, now we're recognizing it. Why I say that is, I remember writing a paper in 2008 with, when it was ISO TS 16949, and we were working with, you know, I saw huge parts 
of organizations that had software that were completely being ignored. And I, I argued at that time, the scope, as you know, the scope identifies a product and, and, and uh, that we clearly need to identify software as being part of the product hardware being supplied. I don't see people still talking about that, but I think it's real important that we all recognize and, and we actually add software right to the scope. But what they're doing in the industry now is they're recognizing it and they're going a little bit further. What are they saying? So this is a continuation of what they're saying is required for software. The planning, designing, writing, testing, conforming, you know, validation phases of software are not very different in concept for the development of hardware parts. Okay. So I'm just going to keep going here. So they want rigor applied. And the rigor they see is they, they suggest two methods and they've consistently suggested automotive spice and CMMI. At Omnex, we recommend automotive spice only because most of the European, all of the European OEMs ask for automotive spice and so has Ford. So it behooves us then to maybe just go right with automotive spice. And what is the role of the internal auditors? Look at that last bullet, which I've bolded out for you. The role of the IATF 16949 internal or external auditor, supply auditor, if you can say, is not to have the knowledge to conduct the ASPICE audit assessment. But you should be familiar enough with the assessment to be able to recognize when a software assessment requirement has not been met and, when, and there are corrective action plans in place, okay, and appropriate resources. Anyway, uh, you know, the auditor, if you're a company that has software suppliers or software internally, there, you know, you need to have the, you know, the, the understanding. So let me share with you a little bit about Automotive Spice. I'm a... Certified Auditor for Automotive Spice. Just to tell you, you know, number one, Automotive Spice, and the word spice actually stands for Software Process Improvement and Capability Determination. See, the E actually comes from the DE part of the determination. Otherwise, it'd be spiced. All right, anyway, spice. And Automotive Spice, what it is, it's an assessment. It's not a pass or fail assessment. I'll talk to you about that in a second. And if implemented effectively, you know, it leads to better processes and better product quality and cooperation between complex supply chains. This is the, these, this is the terminology coming from the Automotive Spice document. So when you look at the, the standard, it actually has system requirements. So, Imagine there's overlap with IATF system requirements, there's hardware requirements, there is software requirements, there are supplier requirements, and so on. Okay, so uh, the idea is if you have it, then you have to put it in place. For those of you who do have automotive spice, you know, I, maybe you missed my webinar where we talked about ISO, IATF 16949, ISO 26262, and Automotive Spice. So many, you know, many companies, electronic companies especially, you know, who are supplying product, you know, for, especially because now the big boom is in autonomous cars and autonomous braking. If you're part of that, you know, market, you definitely have both IATF 16949 ISO 26262 and Automotive Spice. And of course, if you can look at this, you do, I, I hope you see the overlap between uh, 26262 and IATF 16949 right here in this picture. All right, let's go on a little bit further just to tell you something. So this is the rub of it all. Each of these is a process, all right? And if you want to have automotive spice, you have to implement each of these processes in the software, 
in your in your software area. So contract agreement to supplier monitoring to supplier qualification ACQ 50, 15 or system requirements on top here, software requirements, which is you know unique. It's not there in IATF, but definitely there's part six of the 26262 where there's overlap. And then you see supporting processes. So many of these have overlap, but I'll just say this. The automotive spice really, when you look at it, is not following the process approach, okay? It's going back sort of to the QS 9000 or ISO 9001, you know, 1994 standard implemented badly, that is, because even at that time, we used to take the requirements and implement it into processes. But here, they have, uh, you know, requirements for each of these processes that you have to fulfill, all right? All right, so anyhow, so what is the what is what is being circled here in red? The European uh, OEMs have something called a HIS scope. It's a long German word, forgive me if I don't say it. So they're not asking for all of the processes to be done, they're just asking for these processes in red. So if you have automotive spice requirements with your customer, you may want to ask them are the auto his code. Go on. As I mentioned to you, automotive spice is not a pass or fail like IATF 16949 or ISO 9001 2015. It is a process evaluation. So it'll go anywhere from, of course, if it's completely bad, it's a it's it's a CL zero. Level one zero, otherwise it's um, it's a level one managed level two. So managed is when you have all what they call the base practices. The base practices are a list of things that are in the um, automotive spice that you put in place. So lots of times your customer will either say you have to be a level two or a level three. Okay, so established is is really going beyond level. So in, to be a level three, you have to be a one, two, and a three, and um, you need to have it sort of you know company wide, not not for specific projects. All right. So what do you do in a in a A spice uh, assessment? You perform interviews. You study. Work products, work products are records, and and same work product idea is there in in uh, two six two six two. It's it's uh, and and in um, automotive spice, and reading through the procedures slash work instructions, mapping it to the requirements for the process, and um, determining the capability level. There is a documentation review. And then there's also an on-site assessment. Okay. Just a FYI, one of the things we're doing is we our five-day course for internal auditor assessors um, and supplier assessors, I should say assessors actually. Uh, the first three days were making sure the first three days, which is the understanding portion, includes everything uh, an internal auditor needs to know. Of course, if you attend all five, you would get also the credentials to be an automotive spice assessor. All right. So, you know, we're quite involved in automotive spice from doing gap analysis to implementations and assessments. All right. Let's move on. The next is a question on second party audits. And what they said is look, you know, if I have a low risk supplier, uh, do I really need to do second party audits? And of course, they came back and said, really, it's based on your risk based thinking. If your risk analysis shows that you don't need to do, you know, this very low risk, then a second party audit may not be required. Also, interesting here is the criteria they think you need to use for your second party audits. What are they? Their certification status. 
the complexity of the commodity, whether you have a bunch of new product coming with them, with that supplier, significant, you know, um, if there are a lot of employees, product quality issues, delivery issues, customer specific requirements or other risks to the, the organization doing this risk analysis, all right? So that's also a good something to take away from this FAQ. All right, here's what somebody had asked me in a question earlier about uh, process controls. So, and this is about, you'll see this both in the FAQ and you'll also see this in the sanction interpretation. Folks, let me pause here to allow you to write questions and also for me to take a quick drink of water. Let me give you a few seconds here so to write questions. Also, I already see some very interesting questions I need to answer. So I will try to finish this with at least 15 minutes to give so that we can answer some of these questions. All right, so here we are in terms of temporary um, and alternative process controls. And what they're saying is, do I need an alternative process control for each of my primary controls? Of course, I mean, that would be crazy, right? So, you know, um, they said, no, it's not a requirement. However, based on the risk of the primary control potentially failing. So when you're doing your PFMEA and your DFMEA, well, this is more of a PFMEA question. When you're doing a PFMEA, manufacturing uh, risk, you if you, thought, if you look at the risk analysis, you may decide then and there that you do need it. The second time you think you may need it is when something fails. When something fails, there's a failure in the primary process control. Let's talk about when that happens, all right? Then there's no alternative process control is defined. You may want to think about a backup process control. So um, sometimes when there's this failure, it may not result in a product, you know, um, uh, customer failure, it might just be an internal failure, or it just might be a, you know, process control fa failure that you catch. I'm going to go to the next slide and then I'll come back, okay? So if you look at this, here's a PFMEA, and you have the failure. So always remember the, you know, failure mode is nothing but a failure of characteristics, all right? So the failure mode would is actually your product failure that happened. Again, as I mentioned to you, it could be internal failure or a external failure. There's a cause and you have controls. One thing you know for sure, if it did fail, what do you know? Your controls didn't work. So you have to go back and ask yourself, how do you want to change the control? But in this case, it may, you know, you can just ask yourself, maybe you'll even need to have an additional control in place, not just a backup. But one thing is certain, if you have a failure, your control has not worked, right? For some reason. But of course, we do know there is a, you know, occurrence cause and a uh, detection cause. Here we're talking about the escape failure in terms of of this control not catching the problem. All right, so let's go back here. So what they're also saying is, every now and then you should review the instances where alternative process controls have been used. So, you know, if you wait till the end of the year, you're not gonna remember the instances. So it's gotta be somebody very close to, you know, in, in the shop floor, you know, 
I, I worked in a very large plant, my, my own self. I was both in engineering and I was also in manufacturing. And um, But it's my own experience because I worked in a very large factory with thousands of people. Those are the we engineers never quite knew what was going on in the shop floor till I became that manufacturing supervisor. It was when I really understood everything going on to the to the uh, departments that I process engineered. So it was quite an eye opener for me. So yes, many things happen and many things you learn in terms of actual things being failed. And so you have to review this periodically and try to come up with these uh, backup controls. All right, let's go on. The next FAQ is about the quality management system audit. And they said, um, you know, can I just wait to do QMS audits on the third year? And what they said is, no, you have a quality management system processes needed, needs to be audited over a three year calendar period. Okay. Um, it is not the intent of this requirement to allow for all processes to be audited every three years. Folks, I hope it's clear. You need to audit processes as they go along. And if you have processes which are on all three shifts, you need to. So in this one, I actually, we didn't cut and paste the Chinese along with it. So let me just pause here for our Chinese friends to take a good look at what, what we're talking about as I go to this picture. So imagine this is your three-year calendar and your processes laid out. So, you know, purposely pick, you know, processes, you know, where you just did it once. So remember, it should be once in three years. This one we did on the second year. This one we did it every year because it's high risk. This one, it needs to be done on all shifts. So we did shift one first year, shift two and three on the second year. And we again did it on the third year. Okay, I didn't mention it would shift. Anyway, there's got to be a rhyme and reason in terms of why you planned what you planned. And don't forget, it's based on risk. And number two, you got to get all shifts. Then we go on to manufacturing process audits. This again is a question whether you have to do all shifts have to be covered. And what they said is, in one audit, you don't have to do all shifts. Well, you can if you want, but the but you're not being forced to do all shifts in one audit. And the example they say is, they say pressing process. Maybe they should have said a press. Anyway, it's a press. And um, the first year, maybe you're doing shift one and shift two, and you're sampling the shift changeover. Uh, sorry, in the first year, you're doing shift one and shift two, and you're sampling, remember they want you to do the changeover. Then in year two and year three, you're, sorry, in year two and three, um, I'm sort of missing this. Anyway, you can do the, oh, the third shift could be done either in year two or year three. That's what they're saying, all right? So you have to decide. The key is all manufacturing processes must be audited on all shifts over a three year period, okay? And of course, the frequency, again, goes to risk, performance, changes, and so on. And I'll pause here for the Chinese of it. All right, what about product audits? There's no defined audit frequency, and they said, nope, there's no audit frequency. It's really up to you, again, based on high risk, and high product complexity, it is recommended product audit frequency be increased. Folks, so you do need to be able to show that some thought went in to your product audit frequency. All right, again, I'm going to pause here, allowing you to ask questions. Let me answer some of these questions before I go on. I have a lot of questions, wow. 
Um, are there trainings planned in India? Yes, we have offices in in Chennai, Pune, Delhi, and in some part of Gujarat. And we have an office in Bangalore. If that was a question. Um, okay. I see some people had some problems with audio right up in the beginning. I apologize. Folks, I myself, as I told you, I'm in a hotel room in, in Wuhan in China. And I turned off everything on my computer. So I give maximum bandwidth to the go to. That's some of the things you can do to allow yourself to hear things better if you're not in a good setting that has a good internet connection. All right. What were the two changes with the control plan? So you were very interested. Um, folks, I had two questions on that. I think I've answered it, and I'm going to answer. I think it comes up again. If, if, I, if I don't answer it, ask me again. Elizabeth, um, I'm not sure what you mean. Please put on the slide with the majors and minors together. Ah, I see. That's not a bad idea. Oh, there, what I tried to do more was sort of compare how things has changed from, you know, maybe from as the more audits are being performed, Elizabeth. That's what I was trying to do. So what are the three preventive items that we need to be aware of? You know, if you ask me, really, when we go in sometimes, we're seeing basics being completely missed. Basic things like even the process approach, the process map has not been addressed. And um, for whatever reason, in a lot of companies, they are going in pretty much with the ISO TS 16949 system sort of intact and when we go in for the audit. Okay. But what I would say is if you don't have a lot of time and you're in the very end, wait at least three months before, don't call us in the last month. If you have three months, do an internal audit focusing maybe on those 56 items. We look at everything, but focus on those 56 items and create a plan, but you still, you got to get your process approach right, you got to get process owners in place. I will comment, we had Omnix verifier internal auditors. Okay, great, thank you. Is there a FEMA update? Um, I will give you an update in the very end of this presentation. Okay. It's a very specific question on MSA, which is really not the subject of this. Robert, please email us and um, I will try to get that answered for you. The IATF standard states you are to perform internal audits on all processes within a three-year cycle. However, our IATF auditor sent us a readiness review checklist that stated a full internal audit cycle needs to be performed before they audit us. You know, I'll just say that is very true, yes. They're asking for a full internal audit. It's it's uh, before they come in. It's not because they they're asking it. It's actually being asked by the rules document. Then after that, you can go with a three-year cycle. Many customers are attempting to pass the requirements of 8.4.2.2 onto the supply base, uh, okay. 
So if you want, if you pass it on to your supply base, really, then they have to be third party registered to IATF 16949. Okay. I don't have the standard handy with me. Maybe this is more about regulatory. I apologize for my comment. So third party is taking letter from supply base signifying signifying commitment to compliance with statutory. Okay. There is much more, Kim, on this in a in a previous FAQ, which I covered in, in the previous webinar. Okay. Um, folks, I'll do one more here. Um, what does his mean on spice? The his scope, again, I meant, told you it's a long, big German word, which I don't have in my slide right now. It's a reduced scope from about 33 processes to about 15 or 18 processes. Only the red ones I showed you in the automotive spice process list do you need to do. If your customer, your OEM customer says, do a his scope. Could you explain how this affects our suppliers? We don't have software, but if we purchase from a supplier. If you don't have software and if you purchase from a supplier, you still you still need to make sure your supplier is doing automotive spice. Okay. Yes, uh, we do provide training, Noble in ISO 26262. Okay, yeah. I agree, Paula. Uh, certify, okay, it's an audit of the projects. When I mentioned the whole company, I said the processes, I'm not getting the right word here, but there's a very technical word in Automotive Spice. It's not project-based, the, the process itself, it's organizational-based. That's what I was mentioning to you. About the process, and but when you do when you do the assessment, you do assess projects. All right, but it's got to be the same common process across the company. We assemble connectivity devices. Our suppliers supply software. Are we mandated to subscribe to Automotive Spice? Absolutely right. If you're so, if you're going to be IAT of sixteen nine forty nine, and you are. If you have internal software, they need to be automotive spice. If you have suppliers, they need to be automotive spice. Again, you could be CMMI or automotive spice. Automotive spice is the one we recommend. All right, let me go on. And um, I, I, I'm, I'm hoping I have a few more, you know, I'll have more time in the very end. All right, so as I mentioned to you earlier, Sanction interpretations actually become part of the standard because they do change the standard. So there are two of them here that we're going to cover. The first one is on labs. And um, um, the idea that, that the external, commercial, independent lab facilities used for, what are they used for? Inspection, test, or calibration needs to have a defined laboratory scope. Okay, the laboratory shall, it needs to be accredited. Remember I said ILAC, or I hope I said ILAC. It needs to, it's the International Laboratory Accreditation, all right, arrangement and, uh, or equivalent. So that mark we're looking for needs to be a mark from a, you know, a body that, you know, is part of this um, ILAC, okay. All right. Number two. So remember, I mentioned to you there's more on change, you know, temporary change of process control. So what it's saying here, and really the big change is in that the second sentence that you, we need to have a list of process controls shall include a primary process control and approved backup alternative methods if backup or alternative methods exist, okay? So that as, you know, it's very clear. The other one, FAQ, they mentioned to you how to come up with a backup. You do it based on risk when you do a primary FMEA, and you also do it based if there's failure, okay? And then you need to have a list 
showing the primary and backup methods. All right, those were the three comments, the key takeaways I wanted you to take away from this presentation is the, um, is the different levels of training for product safety. Number two, the automotive spice requirements for auditors. Third is the, about the um, temporary change of process controls. Okay? Three very important requirements changes that you're looking for. Again, when you look at FAQs, they say they are not changes, just clarifications. But as I mentioned to you, sometimes if you didn't know this detail, it is really a change for you. All right, what's going on with the AIG VDA FMEA? It's undergone a lot of comments, but um, they, they say the handbook is still slated for a third quarter release. Of course, folks, there's no need to panic. Um, there are no requirements made before the IATF certification. And um, the, the thought is requirements will be more in a end of the year 2019 time period. So some um, suggestions we have, we do have a two-day DFMEA, PFMEA course and a one-day transition. You know, we, we have, you know, We've, we're not offering that right now unless somebody sort of requests that. But we have gone ahead with our software and we have made changes to our software to support the uh, AIAG VDA FMEAs, right? All right. Um, what is our overall conclusion? AIAG VDA DFMEAs, DFMEAs are good for the industry, but there's you know, we think there are some changes that need to be made. Omnex recommends changes in the current VDA AIG PFMEA. And if you joined our webinars on the AIG VDA DFME and PFMEA, we made suggestions. You know, Greg and I were planning to do a much bigger webinar in terms of everything that we saw. And, um, We'll yet do that sometime, sometime soon. All right, folks. So here is a summary in terms of um, what the new things that we see and what we want to share with you. The IAT of certification, certification audits are underway. It appears there's a gap between companies being audited and certified. Data shows it's going to be difficult to meet the deadline and um, also said, you know, I, you may or may not know, I um, ran a registrar for something like 10 years. And um, yes, a registrar feels a lot of pressure. You know, there's a tremendous pressure, I'm sure, right now for third parties to audit, for audit and certify companies. Definitely, it's really hard if you change your schedule, you know, your capacity issues are really prevalent in terms of getting certified. The third comment is a top 56 majors and minors we introduced last year are being consistent over time. If companies want to ensure that preparation, use it, it will reduce your NCs tremendously. We also made the comment Companies need to be more prepared. It's a mystery to, to us why companies are not prepared for third-party audits. I feel part of it is lack of executive overviews and you letting your top management not really understand the gravity of the changes. You know, again, time and again, when something like this is happening, to really make, you know, you've got to make an institutional change right? You're going to get across the board process owners. And of course, Omnex, if you work with Omnex, we're going to tell you about common processes company-wide. These things, it'll, why? Because it'll cut down the amount of work for implementation, plus it's the right thing to do 
for maintenance of the processes. All of these are really something you need to get top management to get involved in. So, and we also said companies need to focus on three major, it's not just FAQs, or also SIs, training for product safety. Internal auditors need to be familiar with ASPICE assessments, able, and quoting from the standard, able to recognize when a software assessment requirement has not been met. Three, need for primary and secondary controls lists. All right. AIG VDA FMEA is planned to be issued in third quarter, and for those planning ahead, it may be a good time to look at software, maybe even do a pilot based on the, the, the standard. It is going to change, but it's not going to change in a dramatically different way because um, it's, it's based on industry practice even today. All right, folks, I'm uh, going to do more Q&A, but I'll just mention to you, I'm, I'm the track chair for the Exemplar Global Symposium on Integrated Management Systems. I want to encourage you all, there are about, about 50 different presentations made by some really top-of-the-line people. It's an online symposium. It's only $99. We'll be sending emails around that. And um, we have seven presentations on integrated management systems. I picked my speakers very carefully. And uh, if you'd like to know about IMS, this is your chance. Oh, So some of the uh, QMS courses we have, risk courses we have, IATF courses we have both here and in China, EMS and integrated management system. With that, let me take, let me do a few more questions before we finish this webinar. Some very detailed questions here, Jackie. Let me read this. If I identify five processes needed for the QMS, so do I address then 4.1 ABC. Now, when you go 4.1 ABC, it's actually you're going back to ISO TS 16949, right? It is 4.4.1 now in this standard. Do I still need to do inputs and outputs and KPIs for support processes like management review and internal audits? You know, the standard does say you need to have inputs and outputs in your processes, and you do need to have, so um, measurement of the processes. So, so what we say is for those processes in your process map, if you do have a process map, because sequence and interaction doesn't have to always be a process map, but for those processes, it's a good idea you know, there's idea of relevancy, of course, and, and that was actually a FAQ that came out in 2000, ISO 9001, 2008. Uh, but you know, it's a good idea to measure not just the key processes, but also support processes if they are in your, in your process map. For risk analysis, a company documented risks on the turtle diagram for each process versus having a separate risk document covering all processes together. Do you, you see that as acceptable? Yes, I do see that as acceptable. But let me just say this. You do need to have something like that at a process level, but I don't believe it covers 6.1 planning risk. The planning risk is or the risk of not meeting intended results right, in 6.1. So you still need to address that. What do we need from the, uh, from a software supplier in their capability? You know, what, what I would suggest is asking your software supplier to be Automotive Spice and, um, and getting them well on that, 
on the path. Right now, they're not saying at a minimum you need to have this, a minimum you have to have that. But pretty soon, they will say at a minimum you need to have a certain level. But you may want to define your own criteria and make sure your software supplier is well on the path to automotive spice. Some of these questions are like on a borderline, you know, and I, I feel a little, you know, I don't, don't want to give you a public answer because they're right on the cusp of things. And you've asked me some very good but tough questions. I see where we have to have manufacturing process audits on each shift. Where this each shift came in is there is this idea that the, in the QMS itself, you have to do all shifts. And what they said is you don't have to do a QMS audit every year. And the intent is not that you do it in the first year and then you do it on the third year. What they said is your QMS is made up of processes, as you well know. They said you can audit these processes, you know, in in and in, in a three year cycle, but if you do have a process that's in a three shift basis, you need to audit that also on all three shifts over the three years. I'm looking to see here. For internal auditors competency, do they need to be certified lead auditors? Or does the attendance in a lead in a attendance does it a three year training three day training enough? So here's it, Philip. The three day class, if you're asking about the Omnex class especially, yes, it, it will suffice for the internal auditor. But the reason we added a fourth day is to cover CSRs and core tools. There's a number of requirements you know, in 6.2.2 for internal auditors. So that internal auditor requirements, all of them have to be covered. So we added a fourth day to cover all of those requirements. And of course, they've also asked you to put down a minimum number of days that an auditor will audit to be, you know, competent. Of course, we can give that to you in a class. Now, what an internal auditor, the difference between internal auditor and third party supplier auditor is the auditing of the FEMA and the control plan that they ask you to also have competency for. So what we have done is we have added another one day additionally from our four day internal auditor course for the supplier auditor to cover all the competency requirements. All right, we'll take one more question after this one. Carrie, yes, we'll, you can get a copy of the presentation. You, do, you know, have be in touch with Miles Haney who introduced this webinar. If I have lead auditor training, do I need internal auditor training also? Of course, no. If you have a uh, lead auditor training and it's for IATF 16949, just make sure it covers all the requirements, you know, that are there. You know, make sure your provider covered, knew the requirements in 6.2.2. Folks, very good questions, and, and thank you very much. I, I apologize. I could not answer all of them, and um, believe it or not, I have maybe reached half here. Um, how can we access previously recorded webinars again? Email Omnex. Folks, we're working hard to do all these to help you. And, um, you know, we have a whole library of audit, I mean, uh, webinars of all different subjects. And if you like this one, you will like all the other ones because we offer a lot of content. Is a list of requirements alternative processes okay if it's in a contingency plan? 
Paula, it's hard for me to say they're asking for a list of primary and secondary processes. It's very clear that they just need to be sort of together, the primary and then the secondary. Without seeing your contingency plan, it's hard for me to give you a good answer for that. Folks, with that, thank you all very much for attending. I hope this was worth your while. We'll continue providing um, webinars of this sort. We have a number of other informative webinars coming uh, this month and next month. Uh, thank you for attending this one and hope to see you in future webinars and tra Omnix training. Thank you all. Bye-bye now.